Okay, the internet is on. Hello, it's Chris. Thank you for uh, joining my live stream. I cannot figure out how to turn off the dinging of my cell phone. Don't worry about that. But I am here. I have my trusty blue sweat sweater on and my trusty blue glasses and my lemon cello LaCroix. And you're all here. Thank you for coming. Um, okay, so what I'm trying to do, just to start basic, is I'm trying to build this YouTube channel. I'm also trying to build my Substack. So if you like newsletters, go to Substack.com and look up Chris Lissa, or just go to chrislissa.substack.com, whatever you want. But so I'm trying to build this. So I talked to the people at YouTube and they said, you know, one way to do that is to do a live stream. And I said, I like live streams. I like taking questions. That should be fun. I'll show you my office in all its glory. That calendar, by the way, is from two years ago. That's neither here nor there. Um... And so I figured this would be a fun way to try to get people involved and take questions. So we got a bunch of questions. If you have more, throw them in the chat. I'm going to try and go through them in a relatively good order. I'm going to take a fair amount of time doing this. I've got my microphone. I hope the sound is pretty good. Um, let me first say, so the big news politically right now is that Joe Manchin, the West Virginia Democratic sort of senator, decided that he is not going to run for president as an independent in uh, November, which is a sort of ish big deal. I think he was a candidate that no labels wanted to run. He's not running. No labels doesn't really have an obvious candidate now, but I will remind people there is third party candidates already in this race. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is going to be on a bunch of ballots and is getting around eight ish percent. Jill Stein is going to be on a bunch of ballots and isn't the uh, green party candidate. Cornell West is going to be at, we think on a fair number of ballots. And so, so there are third party candidates right now. It's a five way race. We assume Trump, Biden, and the three I just named. So even though Joe Manchin isn't running, not sure it matters all that much. All right, let's get to questions and please keep asking them. I'm happy to go as long as I can, uh, in terms of questions. So let's get to it. Okay. Question from Johnny Heritage, what would happen if, tr first of all, thank you, and if you have not subscribed to this channel, do so. Come on, let's do it. Uh, Johnny Heritage, what would happen if Trump or Biden had a major health issue two weeks before the election? Oh, God. Well, I mean, the short answer is chaos. Um, the longer answer is that because the conventions would have already happened, right? So the conventions happen in, you know, August-ish. Because the conventions would have already happened, the... Uh, party infrastructure would be tasked with picking a replacement. Um, usually that's kind of elected leaders and people who are members of either the Democratic National Committee or the Republican National Committee. It's a small group of people. The other problem that would occur there is a logistical problem, by the way, which is lots of ballots would have already be pr been printed. Um, there's early voting, actually, in a bunch of states that would have already started two weeks before the election. So that would be really, really problematic and difficult. The, the actual replacing of the candidate, weirdly, would pr probably be the easiest thing in that there is a set way in which you go about doing that. Um, but the other stuff would be really, really complicated. All right. I'm just going to keep running through these. Uh, uh, Gecko194, I'm glad you don't use the so what title anymore. I always think of that phrase used in a negative dismisses manner, even though you used to use it as here's my point. Yeah. So I have lately been rethinking the so what name. It's also the name of my sub stack. The, the theory behind it, just so people know, the theory behind it is like, I think that news, broadly speaking, can be separated into three bins. What? So what? Now what? Try not to bump, bump the microphone. So when the what bin is like obvious, right? It's like this thing happened. Um, in the now what is where are we going? And in the so what, it's why it matters. So I've always wanted to live journalistically in that so what, sorry, I bumped the mic, so what, now what space, right? A lot of journalism journalism lives in the what space. This thing happened. To me, we spend too much money, time, and energy on that. We always need that. It's always going to be the spine of what we do. But I think people want to know the so what and the now what more now, like, well, what's next here? Why did this happen? Why is it important? What's the context? What's the history, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's where I try to live. So that's why I named it. So what, but I'll be honest, I don't love the name. Uh, and I'm thinking about changing it. So <laughs> thank you that, um, you may uh, tilt me over the edge of, of doing that. So I'm, so look for a possible name change anyway. 
Uh, Nicole McPhee, which sing swing district will you be watching the most closely? So I'm going to assume you mean a house district. I did a little thinking on this because you asked the question a little early, which good for you. Thank you. Um, I think that the one I would pick is Michigan seven. So it's a Lansing area district. Alyssa Slotkin represents it right now. Alyssa Slotkin is running for the Senate, the open Senate seat where a uh, Debbie Stabenow's open Senate seat. Uh, the seventh district she's leaving is a swing district. Big time. Uh, Biden won it by 0.5% in 2020. So it's in Michigan, which I think is going to be a swing state. It's a swing district in a swing state. Uh, the, person who represented it is probably going to be at the top of the ticket or near the top of the ticket as a senator or a Senate candidate. So I think that's a, uh, that's one I'm watching Michigan seven. I generally, I think there's also Michigan eight, which is also worth watching. I don't get too into the weeds here, but, but circle Michigan seven. All right. Uh, let's see what effect, if any, do you think Joe Manchin's decision not to run will have on third party presidential runs by Richard Keeling? Richard, I know you're a subscriber to my sub stack. So thank you for that. And thanks for the question. So I mentioned this a little at the top T to be honest. I don't think the mansion thing is that big a deal, candidly. Um, would it have taken some smallish percentage of the vote away from uh, Biden or Trump? Sure. But like, I think we could debate who it hurt more, particularly if Manchin picked someone like Mitt Romney as his nominee. You know, like, is that a home for Republicans who would have voted for Biden otherwise because they're not going to vote for Trump? I don't know. Like, I just I think we overblow this stuff a little bit. And again, RFK Jr. is getting from what I've seen between six and eight percent of the vote uh, nationally. And that's probably at least what Joe Manchin would have gotten as a candidate. So, you know, I'm a little skeptical about saying third party runs won't matter because we already have three third party runs happening. <sighs> OK, day. Oh, I like this question. Day trading 101. What does a typical day look like for me nowadays? Um, so it's interesting. The, I spend the bulk of my time doing one of two things. One is writing, right? So, um, if you have not gone to my Substack, please at least check it out. There's a bunch of content that's free. I would love for you to become a paid member. It's $5 a month, $50 a year. Uh, if you want to become a paid member, I'm writing between two and three things a day on there. So I usually get up in the morning, make coffee. Uh, I have an espresso out there in the kitchen. Um, sit down and sort of read the tip sheets, you know, political playbook, the Axios one, a couple other things, look at Twitter, X, whatever. And then I'll, you know, I've got a couple ideas usually of what I want to write about. So I go and, and do that. Um, it, the good thing I have is it doesn't take me that long to write stuff. I write pretty fast. And then in the middle of that, what I've started doing is I've started filming videos. Um, I've started making videos for YouTube because I, I just think YouTube is an amazing platform, an amazing growth platform. Uh, there's only going to, it's only going to be bigger and bigger and bigger. And I want to get bigger on it. Uh, and I started off like a year ago, um, making more sort of programmatic videos. I was staring at a camera over here. Uh, I was reading off a teleprompter. It was a lot like what I was doing at CNN. And you know, I just sort of looked at them and I started the new year 2024 and I was like, God, it doesn't really feel like me that much anymore. I think it would be better just to kind of riff. I got this microphone. This was from my CNN days. Thanks CNN. Um, and so I started doing that. So it's sort of split, uh, between writing and talking. I also do some podcasts, um, not of my own. I'm working on one of my own, but, but, you know, I did a slate podcast this week. I did a bulwark podcast this week. Um, so I do a bunch of talking and writing, which is sort of what I really like doing and why I want to keep making this work. Okay. Um, I hope that makes sense. By the way, I also drop my kids off at the bus every morning at 745 and most days pick them up at 345 and I'll do a meeting here or there to, to be totally candid. I'm trying to figure out what the future looks like for me. So I'm meeting with sort of people all over the map from uh, journalists and media organizations to um, people who want to invest in me to companies to, you know, I, I'm really trying to keep a pretty broad approach to what I could do, uh, whether this is something I could do, trying to talk to the people at YouTube, trying to talk to the people at Substack, all that sort of stuff. So those meetings are mixed in there too. Okay. Uh, Jay Moore, when do you think that Haley will, Nikki Haley will drop out? After all, Trump has looked down, uh, locked down the RNC as his personal piggy bank. Um, so Nikki Haley's end game is weird to me, right? Like right after New Hampshire, which was almost a month ago now, um, I 
sort of expected, if I'm being honest, I sort of expected her to get out. Um, I thought that like, you know, uh, she she lost, right? She only won 15% of Republicans in New Hampshire. I know she got 45%, but she only won 15% of Republicans. You know, it was pretty clear to me that Donald Trump's going to be the nominee. And I figured she didn't want to get embarrassed in South Carolina, which was the next big state, right? February 24th, South Carolina primary. Trump was up 30 points. So I thought a couple things. I thought, well, maybe they have numbers. They've seen polling data that suggests that the race is more competitive. Well, that's not true because we've seen polling that's come out in the last week or so that shows Trump up by 30. Then I thought maybe she's just waiting a week and then she's going to get out. You know, she's trying to negotiate what an endorsement for Trump would look like and to get the best position. And that hasn't happened. So at this point, I think she's in at least through South Carolina. And I think she's going to lose by a lot. Um, which again raises the what's her end game question. Um, her end game is short answers. I <laughs> I don't know. Um, longer answer is, you know, I I think people generally suggest to me that Haley is staying in in the event that Trump is incapacitated uh, physically, uh, some sort of health issue, or legally. Uh, I don't see what legally he could be incapacitated by. I know there's a big ruling probably coming today in New York. Arthur and Goron, the, uh, the judge, is going to rule on, on how much Trump should be fined for um, overinflating his uh, assets in order to secure better loans. Like, yeah, that's not great. I mean, if he's fined $370 million, it's a lot of money. But I don't think Donald Trump is going to stop running for president. If he's convicted, I don't if of something in one of these trials, I don't think he's going to stop running for president. So, but I guess that's why Haley is in, uh, you know, as a fail safe, because if something happens, she's standing first in line. Uh, I don't think she's going to be vice president, even though I do think she's probably the best pick for Trump. I think she's charismatic. She's an Indian American woman. Uh, she has a demonstrated appeal among a certain set of Republicans, uh, uh, suburban women, loose, more loosely affiliated Republicans than I think would help her. But, you know, I don't think he's going to pick her because he's, you know, he doesn't, he's annoyed at her. Whatever, man. Okay, let's keep going. Um, let's see. Given both their unpopular, this is Keith Hamster. Uh, given both of their unpopularity, should Biden offer the VP pick to someone other than Kamala Harris, maybe promising her a different role in his government, uh, for example, AG? <laughs> um, No. The simple reason is that's just not going to fly. Kamala Harris is not going to do that. People ask me this all the time, and they say, like, well, for the good of the country, surely you know, Kamala Harris would step down so we could put someone else in. No way, man. Kamala Harris, here, here's what you need to know about Kamala Harris, and, and basically what you need to know about almost everyone who's ever been VP ever. They want to be president. So they're not going to voluntarily take themselves out of the direct succession to be president it's just not going to happen. Um, I think Kamala Harris wants to be president. Uh, I think she will run for president whenever Joe Biden decides not to run, whether that's 2024, which I think is very unlikely, or 2028 when he would be term limited out if he wins. Um, so I think she's going to run. Uh, I don't think she would take a demotion, and it would be a demotion. Look, attorney general is a really important job, but it's not the vice presidency. So I don't see it happening. Uh, I think politicians don't usually make decisions for the good of the country. I think they usually make decisions for their own good. Uh, so <laughs> I don't see it. All right, let's keep going. Um, let's see. Oh, here, here's one. Ideal Idol. Chris, please take down the videos criticizing Diane Feinstein. You know what? That's a really good point. Um, so uh, back, you know, Eight months ago, I made videos saying Diane Feinstein, who was in ill health and, and struggling clearly mentally, should um, uh, resign. She subsequently has died. You know what? I need to do that, and that is a good point, and I will do that. If I don't do it today, I will do it over the weekend. So thank you for noting that. Thank you. Uh, which Senate seats will be close? Well, um, more Democratic seats than Republican seats is the quick answer there. Uh, the three that I think you really should pay attention to, at least at the moment, maybe four, um, West Virginia is already over, effectively. It's a Democratic held seat. Joe Manchin isn't running for re-election. There is no Democrat in the state. Oh, look, it makes, because I'm doing this, it makes a, okay. Uh, Joe, Joe Manchin is is not running. Uh, Republicans are going to win that seat. I think Jim Justice, who's the sitting governor who's running, is probably going to be the next senator. Below that, Montana. John Tester is the Democratic candidate. He has won twice, despite Montana being a Republican state. 
Uh, he's on the ballot in a presidential year, which is not great for him uh, because you're going to get significant turnout. And in a Republican state, that means significant Republican turnout. Republicans looked like they were going to have a primary between Tim Sheehy, who's like a rich guy, who's rich business guy who's never run for anything before, who all the establishment wants. And Matt Rosendale, who's a member of Congress who ran six years ago against uh, Tester and lost. Well, Rosendale got in the race and then quickly got out of the race. Uh, Trump endorsed Sheehy after Rosendale got in. Rosendale saw no point, didn't want to probably give up his house seat. So he's out. So that's good news. That happened all this week. That's I think it happened last night. That time flat circle for me. Um, that's good news for uh, Republicans in that state. It's going to be tough. Third one, Ohio, Sherrod Brown. Now, this is a guy who, Democrat. This is a guy who's won a bunch. Um, he's a populist, always has been. Uh, but Ohio is an increasingly Republican state. Now, Republicans have a, you know, a middling field, I would say. They got three candidates running. Bernie Moreno is probably the favorite wealthy guy. Um, you know, I think Sherrod Brown's in the best shape of those three I just named, but he's not in great shape because, again, Trump's probably going to win Ohio by eight, ten points, and it's hard to overperform that. The only other one I would say people are really close eye on at the moment, just because it's super interesting, is Arizona. So the Democratic nominee is almost certainly going to be Ruben Gallego, a, a member of Congress. The uh, Republican nominee is going to be Carrie Lake, uh, who, who you know from 2020 losing the governor's race, but saying that she uh, didn't, in fact, lose the governor's race. And the question is, Kirsten Cinema, who was elected as a Democrat, has become an independent. Does she run? And does she run as an independent? Does she run as a Democrat? Does she run as a Republican? I think it's a hard race for her to win. Uh, she has not said whether she's going to run or not, but I think it's a really hard race for her to win. So I guess color me skeptical on that, but that's there's just a lot going on in that race that that sort of makes it um, makes it pretty interesting. OK, uh, let's keep going. Uh, Adam Del Judas, Chris, what are the odds that Fonnie Willis recuses herself from the Georgia case? The optics have been so terrible. I think she needs to just bow out and let the other experienced attorneys take over. Okay. So this is the Georgia election interference case. Fonnie Willis is a Fulton County district attorney at issue right now is the fact that she did not disclose a relationship with the guy who she hired as the lead prosecutor, Nathan Wade. In this case, now she contends the relationship began after she hired him. Trump and his people contend it happened before, and therefore uh, Willis is sort of you know giving uh, business uh, and, and profile to a guy that she's in an intimate relationship with. Here's what they screwed up. They should have just admitted the relationship at the start, right? I'm not saying that she should be recused. I'm not saying she should be removed from the case. I'm not a lawyer. Again, I always say this. My mom wanted me to be. Sorry, mom. Um, but like, it just doesn't look good, right? Like it, 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 this case is of critical import, right? It's about did the president of the United States actively use his power to try to lean on state elected officials to change the results in a swing state, right? That, that's what we're talking about here. You don't want that clouded up in any way, shape or form. So the, the hearing about whether she should be removed or not was started yesterday and continues today. And then it'll be up to a judge to, to make that ruling. Um, I don't know what will happen. I do know that it would be a lot better if this wasn't a thing that was being discussed because we know Trump will use anything and everything at his disposal to muddy up the waters. And this helps muddy up the waters. Um, let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Sorry, I'm just going through these. Um, do I think the this is from Brad. Uh, do I think the Republican Party would still stick with Donald Trump if he's officially remo removed from the ballot in several states? So, no, probably not, because it makes it less likely you're going to win. At the same time, I don't think he's going to be removed from ballots in several states. I know the Supreme Court has heard this. Um, I, my view of the two cases in front of the Supreme Court regarding Trump right now are this. Excuse me. Too much carbonated water. On... Um, Total immunity. You know, Donald Trump is claiming he has total immunity. He can't be charged by, in anything that he did as president. My guess is the court is going to say, you're a citizen. You, you don't get complete total immunity. On the 14th Amendment disqualifying Trump from the ballot thing, I am very skeptical that the justices are going to step in and do that. And not just because it's a 6-3 conservative majority, because I think Supreme Courts throughout history have been hesitant to involve themselves in um, Politics, And this would be putting a major 
major league thumb on the scale. If you say, well, this guy's not going to be on the ballot in a bunch of states or a state, it's really, I think, uh, heavy handed. My view of Trump is that if you want to beat Trump, the way that you beat Trump is at the ballot box. And yes, I know he will claim that the election was stolen. I know he will say it was rigged. I know he will not concede, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there will be an election. If he loses, he will not be president, so he will not be able to do what he did in 2020, which is try to bend the will of the election using the powers of the bureaucracy. And there will be a section of people who say he won, and they'll continue on. But I think that's how you beat him. I don't think you beat him legally. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, let me go back. Okay. Uh, scribe Light. By her, we're talking about Kamala Harris again. By her performance over the last four years, do you believe Kamala Harris is prepared to take the reins and command the respect for the Oval Office if such were needed? So, this is always a president that comes uh, president. This is always a question that comes up when we're talking about vice presidents, but it's more relevant now, obviously, than it is usually. And the reason for that is Joe Biden is 81 years old, right? Actuarial tables suggest that you know your longevity. He's about at the end of what the age that a normal American white male lives. Um, here's what I, I don't feel confident that I can say, yes, Kamala Harris could do the job of president or no, she couldn't. Here's what I think though. I don't think Joe Biden thinks that Kamala Harris could get elected. So I think one of, and I'm going to write about this on my Substack. which by the way, if you have not subscribed, you need to do so. Just a quick reminder, subscribe to this YouTube channel, go subscribe to my Substack. Just type in Substack in my name, Chris Saliza, C-I-L-L-I-C-C-A. You'll get it. Just do it. Um, I think that Biden, one of the main reasons Joe Biden is continuing to run is he thinks he is the only person in the Democratic Party who can beat Donald Trump. I also think he thinks that if he was to get out, the very likely nominee, and I think he's right about this, the very likely nominee would be Kamala Harris. She's the vice president. She's an African and Indian, Amer Indian American woman. I think it would be hard, given the dynamics of the Democratic Party, to just take it from her. And I don't think he thinks Kamala Harris can win. I think that's probably right. Um, so that's not a direct answer to your question. That's not saying, yes, definitely, uh, she can be president or yes, definitely she can't be president. I don't know that she can win a November election. Now, could she win a November 2028 election? It's a long time. We'll see, you know, let's see what happens. But I don't know that she can win a 2024 election. I think Joe Biden uh, agrees uh, with that. Okay, Matthew Tondro, La Cheeserie. La Cheeserie to you, sir. Uh, for people who don't know what that means, that's how we greet each other when you are a fan or a guest on the Tony Kornheiser show, which I am. If you don't follow that podcast, you should. It's terrific. Sports, culture. An old man telling stories, complaining. What could be better? Um, he asked, you may have answered a million times, uh, but why politics and not sports journalism? So good question. Um, I grew up wanting to be a sports reporter or a novelist. <laughs> um, as I kind of you know, I, I work for many people don't know this, but I work for George Will, the, the columnist, the conservative columnist in college. Um, he hires Georgetown undergraduates to do research for him for his books and his columns. So I did that for three years in college. And that kind of got me more into the political space than the sports space. And he helped me get my first job, which was with Charlie Cook, the political handicapper. And it just sort of went from there. Um, I think there is an element of kind of luck and just following where life leads you there. Um, the only other thing I would say is sports has always been sports and politics have been always been passions of mine. Um, I like having sports as a hobby as opposed to a job. So I can sort of watch it to relax. I don't really watch politics and watch debates and listen to stuff to relax anymore because it's my job. So I like having that outlet where I can watch, uh, the, you know, I can last night I watched the Warriors, uh, game and just not worry like, Hey, I need to write something about this or I need to be taking notes on this. You know what I mean? Anyway. Um, Melman, why didn't you talk about New York three this week? Shoot. So I did talk about it extensively on my Substack. Sometimes I don't do both. All right. Let me do a quick New York three, uh, riff. Uh, that's just the George Santos seat. This is a district that Joe Biden won by eight point new uh, Long Island district that Joe Biden won by eight points in 2020. George Santos, who, if you are following culture at all, you know who George Santos is. He basically made up his whole life, um, won by eight points in 2022. On Tuesday, Tom Suozzi, former congressman from this area, won uh, the seat in a special election. So 
what does it mean? I think is what everyone wants to know. Does this mean that Democrats are in a good place that we shouldn't worry as much about Biden or that Republicans are fine? And here's what I think it means. First of all, it means that candidates matter. Swazi was a good candidate. He he was a well-known name in the district from representing him in Congress. He had been a county executive prior to that. He ran a good campaign. Um, uh, 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 Philip. Pillup, Pillup, I think the Republican candidate was not very well known. She was a former Democrat. She um, barely appeared in public. Uh, not a very good campaign. So candidates matter. You know, do I think there's something to be said for the fact that Swazi came out and told uh, said Biden should close the border, that he came out and supported the bipartisan immigration bill that the Senate had worked out and Pillup didn't? Sure. Like, I, I think that can be helpful. I always do worry, though, like, let's not add too much into this. Uh, this was a uh, 170,000 people voted, 370,000 people voted when George Santos won. So a much smaller number of people voted. It snowed in Long Island on Tuesday. Uh, again, you had a mismatch in candidate quality. Uh, you had a mismatch in spending. Democrats way outspent Republicans. So, you know, like, I, I think it's always better to win than lose. That's politics. It's always better to win than lose. But I would say... Generally speaking, don't draw too many conclusions. All right, let's keep going. Um, mm, mm, mm. Stephen Williams. I know that in senatorial races, the candidate continues. I recall that a senatorial candidate who died a few weeks before the election still won. His wife took his place in Missouri. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. 1998. No, 2000. 2000. Um, uh, Mel Carnahan was the governor of Missouri, a Democrat. He uh, was running for the Senate. Um, against, I believe, John Ashcroft. Could be wrong about that, but he was running for the Senate. Like three weeks before the election, uh, he died in a plane crash along with one of his sons, I believe. His name stayed on the ballot. What Democrats did was make clear that if you voted for Mel Carnahan, his wife, Jean Carnahan, would be the one they would pick to serve. That wound up happening. Jean Carnahan served in, in the Senate. Um, so, yes, sometimes when you can't take someone's name off the ballot, you got to improvise like that. So it does happen like that. I don't know what the procedures are at the presidential level. Uh, maybe you'd see something like that. But, man, um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Oh, uh, Adam Del Judas, again, he makes a good point. We're talking about third party candidates. He says, don't forget, Gary Johnson routinely got 10 to 15 percent in polls against Hillary and Donald Trump in 2016 and ended with four percent. True. Oftentimes, um, third party candidates uh, poll better. But then when people get in the ballot box and it's like, do I really want to sort of throw my vote away on this? They don't. So good. Good point. All right. Uh, Theo Warner. Hey, you're the only reason I watch CNN. You and my mom. Tell CNN that. <laughs> no, honestly. Um uh, people always ask, like, do you hate CNN? Are you bitter about CNN? No. I mean, I've written about this, but I'll talk about it here, too. No, I don't hate CNN at all. They give me an amazing opportunity for five years of my life. Um, it was great. I got to write and talk about what I love, uh, politics. Um, uh, was it hard in the immediate aftermath of being laid off? You bet. You bet. And I've written about that too on my sub stack. Uh, it was really challenging. Do I feel like I'm in a good place doing interesting stuff that I, I really enjoy and that I hope people enjoy and that I'm a little bit more entrepreneurial now and sort of trying to stay in this space? You bet. You know, I mean, I, I don't want to sound too cliched, but I do think there is a most things happen for a reason thing out there. Um, I think I've become a better husband, a better dad, hopefully a better kid to my mom. Uh, than I was when I was at CNN. So anyway, but th thank you for watching. Um, okay, here's an interesting one. Uh, hey, Chris, uh, and Lay here from South Africa. Hello, uh, loving the life. Uh, I get it. Do you, do you think Americans should care more about non-American politics? Any chance of looking at non-American politics? So, you know what? I had a conversation two days ago about how the fact that more than, I think it's 75% of the world's population has some kind of political election in 2024, which I didn't know, and I think it's totally fascinating. So, do I think Americans broadly will care more about elections abroad? No. I hate to say it. I, we barely can get people to care about elections here. Um, do I think I could do a better job of covering some interesting stuff abroad? I do, especially because I think there is this 
national populist movement that's happening in the world that Trump obviously embodies at least a part of. I don't know if he led it or it's just a part of it, but but he embodies. So yeah, I could do a little bit more of that, and I, and I'll try to do more of that. Thanks for thanks for the odds. Uh, thanks for the thought. Um, let's see. Uh, Adam Smith, I loved your work. Uh, looking at your VP picks, don't you think Trump is going to lean towards a more milk toast running mate? That's why I always assume Christy Noem or Elise Stefanik. Yeah, I mean, I think generally speaking with Trump, it's safe to assume he's not going to pick someone who he thinks will outshine him. Um, I So I did a video on this. I had Tim Scott, the South Carolina senator number one. I don't think Tim Scott would outshine Donald Trump. For me, the issue with Tim Scott is, is he can he be an attack dog? He was too nice in the primary, so I never went anywhere. Oh, dear. I got to stop raising my thumb. Um, I had Elise Stefanik second from New York. Um, again, I don't think she would outshine Donald Trump. Uh, and I had, who did I have there? Oh, J.D. Vance. Maybe J.D. Vance outshines Trump a little bit, right? He's he's famous for the book he wrote. Uh, he's a bestseller. Um, but yeah, I think generally speaking, you're right. Donald Trump's not going to pick someone who will outshine him. Um, and he, by the way, when he talks about the vice presidency, he always says like, doesn't really matter who I pick. It does, you know, it doesn't really change the, the, the outcome, which by the way, I think he's totally right about. So yeah. Um, let's see. I talked about emeritus. I talked about, uh, Matt Rosendale getting in and out of the race in Montana. Just go back if you missed it, or maybe you asked that question and I missed it. Uh, that's in there. Um, Day Trading 101 about my day. Love the honest answer to my earlier question. Keep up the great authentic work. That's what keep, keeps people engaged. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Sorry, I'm stretching. It's funny. Um, The thing that I keep coming back to when people ask me about what I do and why I do it is authenticity. Um, what succeeds best for me is when I'm being as honest as I can be, whether it's about politics or my personal life. Well, you know, this is my office. Like, this is where I do my work. Um, here, look. There are my windows. There's the rest of my bookshelf. There's my other monitor. There's my messy desk. Look, you can see my messy desk. Sorry, it's not great. But yeah, like, I'm a real person. Uh, I like I like talking about politics and thinking about politics and sports and other stuff too. Um, so yeah, I, I think the authenticity thing is really, really big. I'm not trying to be anyone other than who I am. I think there is more money and more clicks in being super partisan, whether super Trumpy or super anti-Trumpy. Look, I, I think Donald Trump represents a fundamental departure from the way in which we've defined democracy in the past 200 years. I always will say that. I don't think it's a particularly partisan statement. I think it's just kind of a statement of fact. Um, but I also think that uh, there are issues in the electorate with Joe Biden. You know, I'm just, I don't see everything through a partisan lens. I never really have. I know it would probably behoove me financially uh, to do so, as whether it's Substack or YouTube or whatever, but it's just, it's not me. Um, Marcy B. Uh, it is also a bad look if the president would change VPs. You know what? I should have said that, Marcy. You're 100% right. Um, you know, I feel like every four years it's, you get these stories and it's like fill in the blank president is thinking about changing VPs or should fill in the blank president think about changing VPs. And I think, so number one, I think that's hard to do. Number two, I think as Marcy points out, um, it looks a little panicky, right? Like it looks like you don't think you can win with the team you currently have, which by the way you chose. So, you know, I don't, I don't think that would work. Um, and I do think it would send a message that Biden thought he wasn't going to win if he kept Kamala Harris. And again, Trump is right about this. VPs don't make that much of a difference. They just don't. People don't vote for the second in command. They vote for the first in command. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm just keeping going through this. Okay. Oh, I like this one. Minnesota and whatnot. Hip hop, Mount Rushmore, individuals or groups, tribe, de la, always enjoy the subtle references. Okay. Whew. This is tough. Uh, for me, by the way, stay tuned for more on the Mount Rushmore theme. I've got a, got an idea there that might, might be something. Okay. So if I can put four individuals or groups on Mount Rushmore, definitely Tribe Called Quest, definitely De La Soul. Um, this is just the kind of hip hop I like. Um, I can't decide between, uh, well, I'm going to put Eric B and Rakim on there just because I think uh, in terms of like what they were doing when they were doing it, they're, they're different. And then 
I think I'm going to put MF Doom. So that's going to be my four. Again, it's not everybody's four. I get it. That's why Mount Rushmore debates are interesting. Again, stay tuned. Um, so, uh, yeah, good question. Um, uh, Topher793, got any inside dirt on CNN or do you have an ironclad uh, non-disclosure agreement? I do not have an ironclad non-disclosure agreement. Uh, sorry to disappoint you. I also have no real dirt on, on CNN, man. Uh, I have a ton of friends there. Uh, the people who were there were great to me. Uh, many of the people who were there are still great to me and have been really supportive of, of, of what I'm trying to do. Um, so yeah, I don't have any dirt. I mean, I, I feel like the, the story of CNN has been written pretty publicly. So, you know, and again, but one other thing I should say, you know, people are always like, man, you must really hate Chris Lick. That was the guy who was the head of CNN when they laid me off. I don't hate Chris Lick at all. I, mean, I don't know him, but he seems like a perfectly good guy. He had a job to do. Someone above him told him, Hey, you know, you gotta, you gotta cut some money. I get it. It happens, right? Like I don't take it personally. Okay. Um, excellent dude, by the way, great name, uh, blessing in disguise, less corporate shackles. Yeah. Like I always think people think that I used to work at the Washington post then at CNN and now on my own. Um, I used to, I, I think that people think that like somehow there's like a boss that tells you like what to write and what not to write every day. I just never really had that experience. Like I can't even count on one hand the number of times I had a conversation with an editor where they were like, Hey, don't do that. And it was never for like corporate reasons. It was because they just didn't think it was good. Or we had another piece going up around the same time that was similar or something like that. So, you know, I never really felt shackled by working for a big mainstream media company. Do I feel, is it easier now where I just wake up and write whatever I want and say whatever I want? Absolutely. Um, but it wasn't as though I was like uh, desperately laboring under like the corporate shackles. Um, Doug Owens, why doesn't anyone hire you? You're brilliant. I never knew that my mom had an uh, a, a, a went as Doug Owens on the internet. But thanks. Uh, let's see. Would Biden's? This is from Jurgen Vogel. Would Biden's chances for re-election increase if he chose another VP? No. Uh, just not. It just doesn't matter. It it, it does not matter. Um, you know, I, I think if anything, it might. It, the the potential boost you would get from picking someone else and the, the attention you'd get would be, as Marcy made the point earlier, would be directly in negatively impacted by the, the the fact that people would say like, oh, is he panicking? Uh, let's see. Uh, da, da. What are this is a good question. Chris Hyde, what are your thoughts about Lincoln Project's belief that the way to win the election is to mock Donald Trump? <sighs> Man, that's hard. Um, so I think for the Lincoln Project, which is a for-profit en entity, it's a good plan. A lot of people really, really, really hate Donald Trump. And there is nothing you can say about him that is too mean, too nasty uh, that th 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 for them. Um, so I think as a business model, it makes sense. Do I think Joe Biden should be that person who's sort of like really personal about Donald Trump? I don't. Um uh, somebody told me a long time ago, you know, when uh, you get down in the mud with a pig, not only do you get messy, but the pig enjoys it. Yeah, I think there's truth in that. Right. Um, I think that there's uh, I I'm not sure you can go low enough that you can go underneath Donald Trump. And I'm not sure voters want you to go underneath Donald Trump. One example I always think about Marco Rubio in 2016, the Florida senator for like three days uh, in around February 2016. He sort of went to Donald Trump's level. He um, he said Donald Trump has small hands, and you know what that means about him. Uh, he said, you know, he's orange, whatever. And, like, it didn't really work because I think people – I said this on a video earlier this week. I think people judge Trump by a different factor, right? I think he's judged as a celebrity. He's not really judged as a politician. All the rest of these people are politicians and are judged as politicians. So, like, yes, it works for Lincoln Project. I get it. Um, but I – don't think it's a winning strategy for a campaign like Joe Biden's. Um, let's see. I'm John Stewart on steroids. Well, I don't know about that. John Stewart's John Stewart. That dude is amazing. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the Supreme Court. This is Corey M. There's a lot of talk about the Supreme Court wanting to appear impartial. Was there ever truly a time when they weren't biased one way or the other? I mean, 
my whole vibe on impartiality or objectivity is that it's very hard to achieve, right? I mean, I think just let's just talk about journalism for a minute. You know, one of the things I always learned when I was a young journalist is uh, like, you got to be objective. You got to be right down the middle. And like my basic view is like, look, I'm a, uh, a, a white kid who went to prep school in New England, who went to Georgetown, who went into journalism, right? That's not everybody's background. So even though I try to be open-minded and thoughtful and um, uh, see all sides of the issue, like I have a natural point of view. I, I think the way that we get around that journalistically is we are open about it. Like this is how I'm thinking. This is if I get something wrong, this is how I got it wrong to work better to get it right next time. Um, so I think it's ridiculous to the Supreme Court is not nine robots that we've programmed to be impartial, right? It's nine people who were appointed by presidents who were political. Donald Trump didn't pick three liberal justices. He picked three conservative justices. So, you know, I, I think that it is impossible to be entirely impartial. Can you adhere to your understanding of the law? Yes, I think you can do that. I think that is what most of the justices try to do is they try to be apolitical or, or less political. But I also think the Supreme Court exists in a political environment where everything is political. So trying to make something apolitical or not political in the Supreme Court doesn't work. Uh, all right, let me, I'm just going to scroll back and make sure I didn't miss anything a little bit higher. Um, hi, Nicole McPhee says, hi, Chris from Canada. Hello from Canada. Uh, I recently wrote a piece on my Substack about uh, Louise Penny's Inspector Gamache series, which is based in Quebec uh, in the Eastern provinces. Uh, if you haven't read it, it's free. Go read it. Uh, and man, I loved it. Make, made me want to go to Canada, even though it's cold. Um, Sam Barron says, Sam, and I know, Sam, you are a Substack subscriber. Thank you, folks. Again, if you do not subscribe to my Substack, just go do it. I would love if you became a paid subscriber. It's $5 a month. Uh, if you can't do that, I get it. There's still a bunch of free content. Crystalissa.substack.com. Uh, Joe Manchin is such an attention seeker, Sam Barron says. Yeah, that's definitely a piece of this. I think he dragged out, drug out, dragged out uh, this whole announcement because he wanted um, – he wanted to get maximum attention for his view that there is uh, not enough centrism in politics. So yes, uh, let's see. Mark Kleinhens. I hope I said that right. Uh, beyond the obvious big line takeaways from judge and Goran's ruling today, whatever those may be, is there anything else that we should be looking for? So here's my biggest takeaway from this. So Donald Trump is, we assume going to be fined some amount of money for overvaluing uh, his assets when he tried to secure loans, right? The question is how much? Uh, Letitia James, who's the New York attorney general has asked for $370 million. Let's just say it's $370 million. I don't think it's going to bankrupt Donald Trump. I don't think he's liquid to a huge amount of money, but he's going to appeal and he's not going to have to pay it right away. But what I do think is important is remember that Donald Trump defines himself primarily through his wealth, right? When he announced his candidacy for president, he said, the good thing about me is I'm really rich. He always reminds people how rich he is, how successful he is. So taking a hit like this will be an ego hit for him. Okay, I don't think he's going to go bankrupt. I know that's the liberal dream that he that like this will bankrupt him. It'll be out on the street. But I do think he will take a hit from it. And I think it's probably worth thinking about that. Um, Sal Mulgrave says, hey, Chris. Hello. Um, let's keep going. Let me see. This is nice. Thank you. Uh, this is Chris Hyde. Thank you. I appreciate your perspective episodically from the viewpoint as a business model versus electronic campaign direction. Thank you. I'm trying. I'm doing what I can. Um, uh, Kristen Sh Christian Shaw. And or, oh, there's a couple questions from Christian. Okay, let me do both. With the current GOP right seemingly living in a different reality with a different set of facts in the rest of the world, can you see us ever going back to some semblance of normality? And then the follow-up is, and or, what do you think will happen to MAGA after Trump is gone? Will it die or evolve or get worse? Okay, so I'm a subscriber. By the way, we've gone 43 minutes right now. I'm going to, I think, why don't we do 50? Because there's still a few questions I want to get to. So why don't we do 50? So I'll do another six minutes and then we'll stop. Um. Tell me if you like this. I'm happy to do this. I love doing it. I love taking your questions. Like, should we do it every Friday? Is that something that's worth doing? Um, anyway, let me know in the comment section. I'll check it out. Okay, so MAGA. So I'm a pendulum guy. So the pendulum has swung way up here, off screen, in terms of our politics. Super par partisan, super polarized. People who are Democrats and people who are Republicans live in totally different worlds. 
it will swing back. Sorry, I'm trying not to bump my mic. It will swing back. The question is when and how long it will take. Um, I don't think Trump goes away until he passes away, right? I, whether he wins or loses, I keep bumping my mic, sorry. Whether he wins or loses uh, in November, I think he's around until he is no longer around, if you get my meaning. What happens then? I think there is a reckoning then. There is a conversation about, is this a national populist party that is protectionist, that is um, uh, isolationist in terms of foreign policy, that is very personality-driven, um, that doesn't really focus on debt and deficit spending, uh, that doesn't really focus on social issues all that much, or is what the Republican Party was in about 2012 when Mitt Romney was the nominee and Paul Ryan was the vice presidential nominee? Or is that the real Republican Party? Now, there'll be a fight there. Um, Donald Trump Jr. might be involved as a candidate. Uh, Tom Cotton, I think, is very Trumpy in terms of where he positions himself. J.D. Vance, uh, Josh Hawley from Missouri. So uh, and Sarah Huckabee Sanders. So there's a whole generation of people that will, I think, try to pick up the Trump mantle. The question is, is that what the party wants? Right now, the answer to that is 100% yes, but I also believe this is a cult of personality that is 100% organized around Donald Trump. So when Donald Trump is gone, the question will be, is this transferable or is it not? And what does that look like? So the pendulum will swing back. I just don't know one. when. Crystal Williamson says, yes, Weekland Friday. Also, try to talk into the mic. I lose what you say at time when you turn away. Okay, I will work on that. I'm sorry. I'm wildly gesticulating sometimes, but I will work on talking directly into the mic. Um, Yvonne says, loving this. It would be a great work routine to listen to this every Friday. Okay, cool. Day trading 101. Do it regularly. Cool. Uh, Anna Ann Sorensen, I think this is a good supplement to the shorter videos. Cool. Um, Keegan Witt, let me do this one. I got four minutes. I posted this earlier, but it may have been missed. Sorry, I did miss some questions. Apologies. I would like to hear about how you developed the point at CNN. Basically, how did the idea come about to present politics in that manner? Well, I had, prior to CNN, I had spent a decade at the Washington Post where I did a blog called The Fix, which was very similar to the point. It was a lot of analytics, um, uh, analysis rather, some data, some charts, uh, but really the kind of stuff that I've always liked doing, which is an event happens, and I try to give people, again, to start from the beginning, not the what, because we got people covering the what, but the so what and the now what. So I've been doing that for a while. So when I came to CNN, I wanted to keep doing it. We just figured out the point made sense. I couldn't call it the fix because the Washington Post owned that. So um, uh, that's how. I hope that makes sense. Um, JFS says, yeah, I'm into it. I tune in. Okay, cool. Um I'd like to Scott McCuller. I'd like to tune in on Fridays. This is very interesting and engaging. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, Super Westman. Chris, I think you're the best political commentator out there. CNN's lost. Thanks. I, I promise. Dude, if there are negative ones, I will read them. I get it. I, I have pretty thick skin, but thank you for the praise. It's really nice to hear. I will say spending five years at CNN during the Trump administration was not great because people would tell me to kill myself basically every day. Um, greedily, this is esoteric Jebus, greedily asking my question from earlier. I see a lot of books on that shelf. Have I ever read Rick Perlstein's four books on American conservatism? I haven't. That is great. Um, what am I reading right Sorry, talking to the microphone. What am I reading right now? I'm reading the Louise Penny Gamache series. I'm reading uh, the Heaven and Earth Grocery Store by James McBride. I don't have a good nonfiction that I'm reading right now. So maybe that's where I should start. I know Nixon Land is part of that. So maybe that's where I should start. If you have books, um, I would love uh, suggestions. I try to read a lot. I read on a Kindle. I try to read a ton. Um, it's something I've always loved doing. It helps me sort of expand my, uh, world. So, uh, thank you. Uh, Gellin, you wear glasses and you are awesome. Keep up the content. I'll watch. I do. It is a hundred percent true, uh, that I do <laughs> wear glasses. I have lots of pairs. Um, this is, these are Zennies. They were like $5. I like blue glasses, not just cause they match with this, but I feel like people don't have blue glasses. So, um, yeah, I have a bunch of pairs, but I've been wearing these lately, but I think it kind of, you know, goes along. Um, Kenan 19. I like it, Chris. And in Scotland, it's at a relaxing at home time. Went to college in North Carolina, right enough. Yeah. So in Scotland, right, it's like 7 50 PM. Good. Um, happy Friday night. Happy weekend. We're almost there. Um, yeah, I think I should do this again. I, I, I hope it helps grow the channel. I hope people like the videos. If you have comments on what else you want to see, whether it's more live streams, whether it's different kinds of commentary, whether it's conversations with other people I could try to do. 
um, let me know because I really do want to grow this channel. Look, I'm not going to be Mr. Beast, although that would be fun. Uh, but I want to be someone who's a reliable political commentator who's bringing you the news in a way that I don't want to call it nonpartisan or, or non-biased because I have opinions, but in a way that is trying to be as honest as I can to myself. I always return to that authentic, authentic, authentic. I'm trying to be authentic. Thank you all for joining this. This was honestly an experiment I wanted to try. So we're going to keep doing this. So spread the word. Uh, again, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. I need your help and support. This is how I make a living. Uh, I need you to subscribe to this YouTube channel. I need you, if you can, to go to Substack, subscribe to my newsletter. I promise you it will be worth your investment. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Chris Saliza or X or whatever. I'm on threads, same uh, uh, address. Uh, I'm on Facebook. Follow me if you can. I'm putting out a lot of content. It makes me so happy to see that it reaches people and, and people enjoy it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I promise we will do this next week. I think I've got the technology worked out pretty well. Um, and uh, you guys rock. Thanks for being part. Thanks for being guinea pigs, uh, whether you knew it or not. Thanks for being guinea pigs on this uh, first adventure uh, into live streaming. This will be archived on the YouTube channel. I'm also going to put it on my sub stack. So uh, have a great weekend. Be kind to one another and be safe out there. All right. Take care.